Daily Tech News Show is made possible by its listeners. Thanks to all of you, including Peter Bohack, Philip Less, Howard Yermish, and new patrons John, Cytrix, Peter, and Fallen and Sea. Yay! On this episode of DTNS, did it take Taylor Swift to make people address deepfakes? Shannon has thoughts on the Pixel 8 Pro's temperature sensor and Samsung's bid to make a comeback in China. Forget it, Samsung. It's China. Not even Chinatown. Just, just the whole country. <laughs> this is the Daily Tech News for Friday, January 26, 2024 in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. And from Studio Animal House, I'm Sarah Lane. From Studio Colorado, I'm Shannon Morse. And I'm the show's producer, Roger Chang. You're jaunty today, Roger. I like that. Am I? Yeah. Doesn't Roger sound like perky? What does jaunty mean? I also thought like that meant you had your, and your graduation and cap at an angle. Having or expressing a lively, cheerful, and self-confident manner. Got it. Well, yeah. you know, we always we we'll always take jaunty Roger. <laughs> There's Jolly Roger, which is your actual Twitter name, right? Sure. Yeah. It's true. So yeah, Jaunty is but uh, a vowel and a couple of consonants away. That's right. It's so close. Um, well, I believe we should start with the quick hits, unless anyone's uh, opposed. Uh, nope. Aye, aye. Motion carried. <laughs> A few follow-ups to Apple's announcement about how it plans to comply with the EU's DMA. Epic Games CEO Tim Sweeney criticized Apple's new policy, which still charges developers even if they don't use the Apple App Store. Sweeney said Fortnite will return to iOS in the EU this year as part of an Epic Games store on iOS. Sweeney also criticized Apple's requirement that operators of independent app stores must show about a million dollars of euro letter of credit to be approved by Apple. The maker of the Proton app also criticized Apple's policies on sideloading and third-party app stores. Separately, EU iOS users will be given a choice of browsers the first time they launch Safari, starting with iOS 17.4. App makers will be able to choose other browser engines beyond Apple's WebKit as well. Opera already announced it will have a new browser for iOS in Europe coming in March with lots of... Oh, AI. Good. That, that, then I know exactly what it'll have. Also coming in iOS 17.4, auto-generated transcripts for podcasts. Uh, transcripts for podcasts in English, French, German, and Spanish will be available in more than 170 countries. It's going to work like Apple Music lyrics work. You'll just uh, click the little quote button, and then the transcript will play out while you're listening to your podcast. The words will be uh, uh, available shortly after publishing. So if you listen to a podcast right away, it might not show up right away. Uh, and podcasters can choose to upload their own transcripts as well. Bloomberg passed along a report from o Omdia analyst Hiroshi Hayase suggesting that Nintendo's next console, sometimes referred to as the Switch 2, although that is not for sure, will launch this year featuring an 8-inch LCD screen. That is a downgrade from the OLED switch, but an upgrade, obviously, in size. Last year, Sharp said it was supplying LCD panels for Nintendo's upcoming console. The Switch Lite has a 5.5-inch screen. The original Switch model screen is 6.2 inches. The OLED switch has a 7-inch screen, so 8 inches. It's big. The biggest switch yet. Uh, in another sign that China is easing up on video games, the government approved licenses for 115 video games in January. That's the largest number of approvals in 18 months. This follows the removal of a proposal to increase restrictions on in-app purchases and other things. The National Press and Publication Administration of China issued 1,076 licenses for video games in 2023. They only issued 512 the year before, so big increase overall. The estate of the late George Carlin has filed a lawsuit in Los Angeles federal court calling for the removal of the dudesy video that showed a generated George Carlin doing a comedy routine about current topics. The folks behind dudesy claim the entire routine was generated by a model trained on Carlin's works and call it an impersonation. The Carlin estate calls it use of copyrighted materials and likenesses 
without permission. The state asks the court to the, uh, to order the immediate removal of George Carlin, I'm Glad I'm Dead, that's the name of the show, which was posted January 9th on the Dudesy YouTube channel. The suit also asks for the destruction of all copies of the special and payment of unspecified damages. Dudesy previously removed a comedy special made to impersonate Tom Brady after Brady himself or his camp threatened a similar lawsuit. Which makes me wonder why they didn't uh, cave this time, because presumably the Carlin estate told them they were going to file this lawsuit, and uh, they decided to fight it out. So it's a little bit interesting. You know, um, uh, Ars Technica had a really interesting article showing evidence that maybe the dudesy thing isn't as AI-generated as they would like you to believe mm -hmm, as well, mm -hmm. which I buy. There had to be some some editing. There had to be a human touch at the end. Just make it smooth. Just based on what Gavin uh, was saying last week about how they do their AI, you know, there's right. just not just not tools to do this. Samsung launched the Galaxy S24 in China, but instead of using Google's Gemini models, because Google doesn't really operate a lot in China, it's using Baidu's Ernie. Uh, Baidu launched Ernie back in August. It will do translation, summarization, text formatting, real-time call translation, and a feature similar to Google's Circle to Search. So they're trying to replicate the Gemini feature set on the Samsung Galaxy S24, but with a different engine that is more amenable to the Chinese government. Uh, Google operates in a limited way in China, but mostly in advertising. It does not offer Google Play services or any of its hardware or even Google Search. Uh, Baidu received government approval to launch Ernie. Uh, Google likely doesn't want to submit to government scrutiny for that, so it's not possible for Samsung to use Gemini there. Uh, also, Samsung's no longer the top five smartphone brands in China. Remember, we had that story that Apple uh, leads the way. Huawei's on its way up. Vivo is is up there. Xiaomi's up there. Uh, so Samsung would like to get back in the game domestically. Everyone talks about, oh, is Apple's sales slowing down in, in China? Uh, Samsung has a real problem in China, and uh, it would it would like to get that back. So maybe partnering up with a domestic agency like Baidu uh, is the way to go. Uh, Shannon, what do you think? Do you do you do you do you believe that? I don't know. We none of us have used Ernie, but what what do you, what do you think about the chances of a domestic company in China being able to replicate Gemini? Well, maybe it will help. I mean, obviously, we are bigger fans of like Google's Gemini over here, and I. Just in my personal opinion, I would love to see a comparison between uh, Baidu's Ernie and Google's Gemini just to see like which one is better side by side. Uh, so I'm I am very curious to see if this would like potentially help sales over there. Like maybe since they are partnering up with something that is from China with Baidu, uh, maybe that will allow them to lower the prices of the S24 series over there and possibly sell more of them. Like that could be a potential marketing uh, thing that they could exploit over there. But it's it's really kind of I'm not really sure. I'm, I'm very, very curious about it, though. It's hard to hard to, to to get a fair estimate of how good Ernie is yeah. either because it it's been sort of shrouded in mystery. Uh, it has. It's limited in what it's allowed to do, frankly. So this will be putting it into its its most stretched use case. I feel like. Yeah, and, and that that was the way that I felt. Um, you know, going into, <laughs> into the story, and we talked about this in our pre-show. I was like. Have we talked about Ernie all that much since August when it was released? Not that it isn't, you know, a great OS, um, and, but uh, well, for not an OS, a, a chatbot, yeah, 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 exactly. Um, a, a, a part of an OS, um, but for a variety of reasons, um, uh, you know, Google going this way, um, or Samsung rather going this way. Makes a lot of sense, but again, would love to know more about, you know, how people who have used Ernie in, in uh, I don't know, some, uh, some capacities have thoughts. You know, obviously, like as a as an Android reviewer, all of the phones that I'm checking out and personally trying, like physically in front of me, they're all they all use Google. So for me, if I was ever to be able to test 
Baidu's Ernie next to it, it would be a very fascinating experience. And I don't know if, like, from a usability standpoint, if I would just be more biased ter- towards, like, Google's Gemini over Ernie, just because that's what I'm used to. And I'm also curious of, like, if there's any other reviewers here in the United States who have had an opportunity to use it because it is fairly new. It just came out in August. So we really haven't heard much about it here in the United States in terms of like our own marketing. Well, yes and no. It hasn't made headlines here, but there's tons of stories about it. If you go looking for it, I just found one from CNN Business a month ago where they actually compared it to GPT-4. So not not the same as comparing it to Gemini, but Mm -hmm. they said Ernie was better than GPT-4 on general news. Uh, at least the kind of news that's allowed in China, which is a lot. Okay. Um, the uh, the takeaway CNN said is it's pretty good. You can't go wrong with either. Um, they oh, asked both hear. bots to help a hardworking graphic designer ask their boss for a raise, and they each outlined compelling arguments. Uh, Ernie still saw, seemed to get confused at times, but then so did GPT-4. Uh, and, of course, if you ask it about Chinese politics, it just goes, I don't know what you're talking about. Uh, <laughs> let's start over. What? So, no. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> So do uh, you yeah, think it seems that like it this performed is, pretty well, according to the CNN article? Do you think that this is like Samsung's play to get more marketing power and more yes, of a, a, like a hold yeah. in China? Yeah, uh, it, it's it makes got sense to, to me right? too. Yeah, if it wants to compete at all, it's got to have a product in China that feels on par Mm -hmm. with the product outside of China. Mm -hmm. And this is a little bit of a leg up to be like, hey, patriotism. (laughs) You you know, there's a little bit of (laughs) anti-American backlash uh, in the U.S. And Samsung can take advantage of the fact that it's not an American company. Use a domestic product in Ernie and maybe score a few points. You know, Mm -hmm. I don't think it's the magic bullet or anything, but but it, it can't hurt. Mm -hmm. Uh, Real quickly, though, Shannon, you just got the new Galaxy S24, the worldwide edition, the one with Gemini on it, uh, minutes before the show. So I know you've like just pulled it out of the box. I haven't had a lot of time to spend with it. But what do you think so far? Yeah, I did. I I got it like not even in the last like 30 minutes. I've been able to uh, get this thing set up with my account and I was able to download some applications on it. And so far, it's a very smooth process. Um, I will say this is my first titanium phone. This is the S24 Ultra. It's the first one that I've ever had that's titanium. So I'm very curious about the durability and the use cases in that that sector. Uh, but also curious about the screen, because I've heard that this one is a little less vivid than the S23 Ultra. So I'm very, very curious to see if that's going to affect like how much I like looking at this screen compared to the old one. Uh, in terms of how fast it's running and everything, it's a brand new phone. Like I just took this thing out of the box. The box is right over there in my studio. Yeah, so yeah. it's it's nice and fast. The performance is looking really good. Uh, the photos look really nice and sharp. I we just got some snow here in in Colorado, so I fully intend to take this thing outside in really bright sunlight in Colorado weather with all the snow on the ground and see how it does with like all sorts of whites and all sorts of different colors. So I'm I'm pretty excited about it, uh, especially given that this one does have the the new circle feature and a lot of Samsung's AI is being brought into the S24 Ultra. So yeah, it's it's very exciting to finally have my hands on it. And it did arrive a little bit early. So I'm super stoked to be able to use this thing over the weekend. But so far, so good. It looks good. Oh, and also, I don't know if anybody cares about this, but I care. They didn't put the IMEI on the back <laughs> of the phone, which if you're into a security and privacy, like people mm-hmm. can clone IMEIs and it's nice to not have it there. So I can take pictures of the back of the phone without anybody cloning my IMEI. <laughs> well, Shannon, uh, speaking of things that people thought were curious decisions design-wise, <laughs> Google updated the Pixel 8 Pro this week to allow for a new body temperature sensor feature with clearance from de novo FDA, which some other companies use. To use this particular feature, you sweep the phone's infrared temperature sensor over the side of your forehead so it can read a level. The Verge notes that the phone's temperature sensor is located in the rear camera array, which makes it kind of that much harder to gauge if you're taking your own temperature correctly because you can't easily see the screen. What do you think? (laughs) 
<laughs> yeah, what do I think? Uh, so I did get to demo this. Uh, I have the fully updated temperature application on my Pixel 8 Pro. So you do have to update your app if you're curious about using this. Uh, the sensor, specifically, if you're watching this on video, it's going to be directly under the flash on the back of your phone on the rear side. And given that it's not directly centered, that can make it kind of finicky whenever you're mm -hmm. actually trying to use this because you do have to place it a little bit over to the side, uh, which they don't really go into that explanation in the videos. They just tell you, this is where the sensor is, place it near your temple. So you do kind of have to figure that out. It actually took me three tries to finally get it to figure out where I was trying to place it, which is kind of a user error thing, but also goes to show that this is going to be a very, very precise thing like you have to get it in a very precise place and then I'm not even really sure how accurate the temperature is on here it does give you a historical data point uh, to tell you what the temperatures readouts were whenever you're testing this on like your body and my last one was 98.3 I can run another one right now and just see if it uh, does any better or if it's just as close and see if my temperature changed at all and another hard thing is like you have to move your hair Hope, hopefully <laughs> right, you put you it in the right place forehead. yeah yeah right yeah mm -hmm. it's it's comp oh did it work no it's says yeah and you don't range. know yeah yeah but you don't know because you can't see the screen so it's kind of it's it's definitely not something that i would use all the time uh one in one scenario i feel like it would have been useful i was coming home from ces and hanging out with tom and i was so worried that i was getting him sick <laughs> it would have been nice to be able to use this while i was mm. at the airport just to test it out and be like, okay, like, should I avoid him? Should I, like, I make sure that there's social distancing going well, on? Because I have And no that idea. would be the point of yeah, this yeah. whole thing, right? Is like, oh, yeah. Oh, if I have a fever, you know, I will tell my friend, you know, whoever I've been in contact with. Um, the Verge, uh, who also checked out the this feature, explained a scenario where one of their writers had come in from cold and his temperature was 95 degrees Fahrenheit, which is <laughs> that's, that's very cold, quite low. Yeah, yeah, like to the point where it's like, oh, are you hyperthermic? Yeah, you seriously. know, like, <laughs> have you fallen to a lake type of thing? <laughs> um, oh, and, God, you know, and that wasn't the case. It was just sort of, you know, whatever it was. But it's just not um, very accurate is what there, there could be conditions where it's not very accurate. Exactly. I, th I think and I think that's where the conversation goes. Like if you're just kind of trying to like, hey, is my kid sick, you know, type thing, like maybe they have a fever. <laughs> this might be kind of a pretty cool tool. But if it's actually trying to be really, really um, specific about, you know, what's going on, you know, <laughs> on on your bod um then yeah doesn't sound like it's quite there yet and yeah. the, the and the and the very weird thing about you know like well it's using the the back camera instead of the front facing camera that actually does make a difference it's well it's kind of awkward <laughs> I, I would say, like, if you are using the back camera, like, if, if you do put it a little bit too close to your face, you might get a bunch of oils on there that might mm -hmm. skew the results yeah. as well, and mess which up is something lens. that, mm -hmm. yeah, exactly. It might mess up your camera lens, too. So you have to keep that in mind as well. You're not supposed to put it directly on your skin. Um, I just noticed it's kind of hard to do with glasses, too, because you do have to put it pretty oh, yeah. close within right. millimeter range of your temple so it's easier for me if I take off my glasses and then I put it up there so yeah it's uh, I think that it's something they should probably work on a little bit more because right now it's just it's not quite there it's a little bit too it's too much of a gimmick and I feel like it's not going to be easy enough for most people to use so you're you're cool on it I'm <laughs> cool on it, yeah. Uh, according to this, though, my my temperature that I just took is 98.6, so I'm oh, pretty pff, normal. Bang, you bang are, on. you are a yeah. healthy yeah. person. It's perfect. <laughs> That's yeah, good. Well, yeah. <laughs> uh, if we believe that <laughs> as accurate, <laughs> then yes. Uh, folks, real quickly, uh, we did a little change on top five. Uh, Roger, uh, trying to improve the production of it all the time, uh, suggested that we shorten it up. 
make it 60 seconds, uh, make it easy to watch on all the platforms like TikTok and Reels and everything. Uh, so the latest version is a faster version of the top five. And it's the top five things you could do to afford an Apple Vision Pro. How do you get $3,500 real fast? Uh, we've got answers for you. Check it out in our new 60 second style uh, on TikTok, on Instagram Reels, or at youtube.com slash daily tech news show. All right, let's get into this Taylor Swift thing. 404 Media says that deep fakes, images, and videos of Taylor Swift that took over X uh, originated on Telegram. There was a group there that for a long time has shared explicit images made with Microsoft Designer. It's a thing they were doing over in a dark corner of the internet. Somehow, some of those images went viral on X. Why things go viral is a mystery in and of itself. But, you know, combination of AI interest, X weirdness, and Taylor Swift, you know, you can sort of see where, how that would happen. Uh, obviously, these deepfakes violated X's zero tolerance policy, but the platform seemed a little slow to catch up. And one post in particular was seen more than 47 million times before it was taken down. Uh, Taylor Swift's fans fought back, uh, not only reporting these things, of course, but also posting in large numbers under any hashtag associated with the deepfake in order to make it harder to find the deepfake, right? So if the hashtag was like Swift I don't really nude, understand how that well, here, works. Yeah, let me explain. If okay. the hashtag to find the deepfake is Swift nude, right? Hashtag Swift nude. Uh-huh. Have 30 million Taylor Swift fans, and that's not an exaggeration, all post with the hashtag Swift nude and then her latest video that is non-controversial oh. so that when you go to search for the hashtag, so you're not really burying you're it. seeing you're a bunch just, of legitimate yeah. results instead of seeing the one that everybody was trying to get you to see. Oh, that's smart. Yeah, uh, it was clever. Uh, X says it has removed almost all of the posts now and the associated accounts and it is continuing to monitor. Okay. So now Congress in the U S taking advantage of this, saying uh, this is U.S. Representative Joe Morrell calling attention to the Preventing Deepfakes of Intimate Images Act that he proposed last year, real one. Representative Yvette D. Clark chimed in saying, what's happened to Taylor Swift is nothing new. Also, as advancements in deepfake tech make it easier and cheaper. Congressman Tom Keene Jr. said, whether the victim is Taylor Swift or any young person across our country, we need to establish safeguards to combat this alarming trend. Okay, so Taylor Swift herself has not commented, although the Daily Mail says sources say that the Swift camp may be considering legal action against the sites involved. Shannon, uh, you and I have both been women on the internet for some time. Um <laughs> What, you know, what, what do you think here? What do you think is the best course of action? <laughs> I love your, your description because like, and, and not even just women on the internet, like if you have any kind of public facing photos or videos, like you could be a victim of this, you could be victimized. And I know personally, I've had people Photoshop my face onto very lewd images and post them on all sorts of forums and places like that. And I've had to send more DMCAs than I can count off the top of my head. Like it's just been something I've dealt with ever since I was in this career. So personally, I'm I'm angry for her because I know how it feels mm -hmm. to have somebody create that, which can hurt your reputation and it can hurt your credibility with your fans or your viewers or whoever course, is out there. Yeah. So I'm, I'm angry for her just as somebody who has experienced similar. I've never experienced something with deep fakes, like going that route, but given that it is getting easier and easier, like that's something that I've thought about just as a content creator. Like when it happens, it's not really like if it happens, but when does it happen? And will it happen at a time that there's some kind of regulations involved to protect me as a public facing figure? Like, how am I going to be able to take down these these potential deep fake photos if they ever did happen? Like, what is the thing that I'm going to be able to do to protect myself? Um, yeah. One thing 
that I've used in the past, other than just DMCA takedown notices to websites that post these without your consent, is uh, MD5 hashes, which is so like encryption like this is very much in the the hacker era of my life and my career but with md5 hashing uh, a lot of times people would use md5 hashes to determine if a original file is equal to the file that you receive and it's something for security and privacy as well as just determining authenticity and i'm wondering and this is just something that i've like kind of uh, hypothesized is, is would there be a way to take something like an MD5 hash and, and like stick that onto photos of your face or videos that you post on YouTube or wherever it's going, because it's code, it's coded into the video or in the photo or in that file that you're uploading. Uh, even if somebody erased like all the, um, all the metadata off of a photo, like that MD5 hash is still going to remain the same. So is there a way that we could take some kind of hash and add it to photos and videos so that if somebody did end up creating a deep fake based on pictures of you, like, is there a way that you could say like, no, that's not actually indeed accurate and social media could look at the uploads of these deep fakes and say, and, and somehow, I don't know, like immediately not allow them to be posted. Like, is yeah. there something out there mm -hmm. that we could do to protect people? And right now, there's not really I, anything I out think, there protecting us. I think us. what you're laying out, like, that sort of two-step is, like, we need, uh, you know, these files to have something inside them, yeah. you know, that somebody can't get around to say, like, I did this, and this is, you know, <laughs> this is the way I did it. We all know. You know, and whether or not you find that to be, you know, right or wrong, then there's the whole other thing of someone's likeness being on the Internet, not being part of their actual likeness. Um, that is, you know, that stuff, again, being, you know, part of a public facing person as Shannon, you know, you certainly are, you know, we all are really. I mean, I think that's 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 very it's a, it's a, it's, it's a, it's a hard line to walk. Mm -hmm. Um, what I think, you know, is best served at this point is just like figuring out if something isn't real, there's some, there's some little, little something in that metadata that just lets anyone who cares to know, know that it's not real. Like a watermark. Yeah. <laughs> I like think this that, is a fake watermark. <laughs> I, I think that's an important step is for platforms uh, and creation. And this this is very similar to the argument about AI, being able to tell if something is AI or not in the first place, right? Yeah. I think that that is helpful. It's not the only thing that should be done either. Mm -hmm. uh, I think Certainly you also not. you also need a law. You need a law so that, that you can dissuade people from doing this because everybody's going to be able to get around whatever technological measure we put in. It's a speed bump. It's, it's not that it's not worth doing, but it's not going to stop it. You're still going to have people who find clever ways around because that's how the Internet and hackers and everything works. Right. So what do you do to dissuade people from wanting to do 47 million versions of these? Uh, the United States has no federal law that that punishes right. someone. It's not illegal for them to do what they did. It's just against the policy of Twitter. In the UK, they have the Online Safety Act, which you can debate whether that's a good law for lots of other reasons. But one of the things it does is it makes it specifically illegal for you to publish this sort of thing without permission uh, so that the person who wants to be like, yeah, I, I am in control of my image. I, I want it to be out there, can do it. But if you don't have their permission, you can't do it without their permission. There are some uh, state laws being implemented, and there's a few that are already out there that do protect you from uh, having non-consensual photos posted without your consent. But that has nothing to do with deep fakes. It has to do with like photos that you, you sent somebody in the past or that, that might've right. gotten leaked through that, a hack yeah. or something like that. You, some, so somehow are out of your control at this point. Yeah. And we have nothing federal in that sense. And we also, like you said, Tom, we don't have anything federally for, for deep fakes and for those kind of protections. So like, there's also like an argument for the creativity of deep fakes and how, like, are we going to still be able to 
you know, use our artistic creativity to be able to create our own images and stuff like that. But like, where is, where is that line? So it's, it's such a big debate. And it's something that I've, um, of course, since I've had like those disgusting photoshopped photos posted about me, like in the past, it's something that I feel very deeply about. And I just, I want to see something happen, but it's like, where's, where is that answer? Technically, like I want to see something happen with the photos themselves, but we do need some kind of federal ruling that protects you across state lines, especially when the people that, that are doing this, chances are they don't live in the same state. Yeah. And the good news is, uh, unlike a lot of things around AI or net neutrality or any any of the other things we grapple with, uh, this has bipartisan support. Uh, mm -hmm. we, the, the three representatives that Sarah mentioned uh, were from different parties. So they may even be a chance of getting something done. And uh, if if it takes Taylor Swift uh, bringing attention to it, well, then it takes Taylor Swift bringing yeah. attention to it. Uh, a lot Go of times Swifties. that's what it takes. So uh, <laughs> I'm sorry that it had to be her to do it, but maybe that's what helps get something taken care of. Well, Shannon Morse, uh, the good news is that we rarely talk about things like this. We we talk more about all the cool stuff that you're doing in your life. Let folks know where your latest can be found. YouTube.com slash Shannon Morse. Uh, I haven't posted it yet because I just got the phone in, but I will be posting an S24 Ultra review, some pro tips, especially going into the new AI features and some photography versus videos. I'm so excited to check it out in more detail. And I also have some really fun reviews coming up of some alternative choices for Android phones mm. uh, in February too that I can't talk about quite yet. So I'm really excited about those too. Fantastic. Uh, well, we had a bit of a weighty topic there. Uh, it was it was important to address, but uh, let's lighten the mood, folks. If you're a patron, uh, stick around for the extended show, Good Day Internet. It's Friday, so we're doing something fun, which we like to do on Fridays. It's another round of Who Am I? Can you guess the actors who shot to stardom partly because of Netflix? Play along with us. Oh, well, just a reminder, you can catch our show live Monday through Friday at 4 p.m. Eastern, 2100 UTC. Find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. We hope you all have a wonderful weekend. We're back on Monday doing it all again. Talk to you then. This week's episodes of Daily Tech News Show were created by the following people. Host, producer, and writer Tom Merritt. Host, producer, and writer Sarah Lane. Executive producer and booker Roger Chang. Producer, writer, and co-host Rob Dunwood. Video producer and Twitch producer Joe Kuntz. Technical producer Anthony Lemos. Spanish language host, writer, and producer Dan Campos. Science correspondent Dr. Nikki Ackermans. Social media producer and moderator Zoe Detterding. Our mods, Beatmaster, W. Scottis One, BioCal, Captain Kipper, Steve Gautarama, Paul Reese, Matthew J. Stevens, a.k.a. Gadget Virtuoso and J.D. Galloway. Mod and video hosting by Dan Christensen. Music and art provided by Martin Bell, Dan Luters, Mustafa A., Acast, and Len Peralta. Acast ad support from Tatiana Matias. Patreon support from Tom McNeil. Contributors for this week's shows include Scott Johnson and Shannon Morst, and our guest this week was Kevin Pereira. Thanks to all the patrons who make the show possible. <laughs> This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>